Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify, Apple, or Google, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. They're one of my go-to exchanges. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. You can also trade precious metals and equities on this platform. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the link in the description. Well, folks, today, Gary Genser made two appearances, and boy, was his body language and his speaking and all, his whole aura was just timid. It was uh, a, a reserved Gary Genser. And I think because of the loss in the Ripple lawsuit, all the backfire he's getting on the Coinbase lawsuit, uh, just a whole bunch of things are not going Gary's way. So first, he was speaking at the National Press Club, and he was, of course, asked about crypto. Then he was interviewed be, uh, via the folks at Yahoo, and it almost seemed like he didn't want to talk about crypto. So here's the headline from BlockWorks. Forget crypto. Genser says AI is the transformative technology of our times. SEC Chair Gary Genser advises the press and public to focus on the transformative powers of artificial intelligence, not crypto. <laughs> I wonder why he doesn't want to talk about crypto anymore. <laughs> Um, and one of the comments he made at the National Press Club is, and while we're disappointed on what they said about retail investors, we're still looking at it and assessing it. Let me play the clip here for you guys so you can hear it directly from Gary. Uh, we are uh, pleased uh, from that decision, recognizing uh, the importance of protecting investors on the institutional investors uh, in that, uh, and that the court... Uh, um, uh, movement with regard to um, fair notice uh, and while disappointed on what they said about retail investors uh, we're still uh, looking at it and and assessing that opinion so there you have it folks uh notice he's talking about oh you know we're disappointed in the retail investor aspect of it you're supposed to be protecting in retail investors you fool so gary's looking like a fool obviously big loss in the uh, ripple lawsuit coinbase is suing the sec and the judge is even siding with the coinbase saying how uh, what are you guys doing you approved coinbase you gave them the approval for the s1 to go public now you're saying they're conducting illegal securities offerings uh, is it, just asinine, right? And then, of, of course, Grayscale is suing the SEC over a Bitcoin spot ETF. And while Gary and these folks have been going around saying, oh, yeah, it's not the right time. We don't have all the things we need, despite them approving a Bitcoin features, a Bitcoin shorts, and a Bitcoin 2x leverage uh, ETF. Uh, and then all of a sudden, BlackRock and the entire TradFi market they start applying for Bitcoin spot ETF. So it makes the SEC look like idiots, uh, specifically Gary Genser, of course. Now, the interview with Yahoo is too long, um, so I can't play the entire thing. But you know, the reporter was like, Gary, I can't let you go without talking about crypto. And then he's like, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, well, there you go. Um, and as though he didn't want to talk about crypto. So I tweeted about this and I said, Genser almost seems like he didn't want to talk about crypto, which is big. And it looks like some of the wind has been taken out of his sails. He's not as bold. He's not as aggressive with his talking points, right? You just look back maybe about a month, the man was like, there's hucksters and scammers and all types of bad activity in this market. And why do we need crypto? We already have the US dollar in digital format, right? These are the statements the man was making all bold and puffing his chest out. Now he's kind of timid. He's kind of like, yeah, I don't want to talk about crypto. Let's talk about AI, guys. <laughs> Folks, all the fighting we've been doing, all the tweeting, all the contacting our representatives, it is working. It is working. And keep it up. Don't let your foot off the gas, folks. We need this scumbag regulator kicked out. This is why I've been saying the courts are going to expose Gary Genser. He got exposed in the Ripple lawsuit. Uh, the, the judge already in the Coinbase lawsuit is siding with Coinbase, right? 
So uh, things are moving in the right direction for exposing this corrupt regulator. And we need Congress to act. We need comprehensive regulations to be pushed through. Now, we got an update here about Judge Sarah Netburn and the next steps in the Ripple XRP lawsuit. So Judge Sarah Netburn orders both Ripple and the SEC to agree on three mutually convenient dates to schedule a settlement conference if they believe it to be a product uh, it to be productive at this time. Uh, so it's if they want it to be that way. And here, Eleanor Tourette of Fox Business said, to be clear, Judge Netburn is suggesting that both sides agree on some possible dates for a settlement meeting if they believe it will be productive at this time. This doesn't mean we'll see a settlement in six to eight weeks. It means that if they do decide on a date, it will have to be scheduled six to eight weeks in advance of the desired date due to the court's busy schedule. In meantime, or in the meantime, one or both sides could refuse to hold a settlement conference or simply fail to come to an agreement if slash when they have the conference, or they could both potentially come to a settlement agreement asking the lawyer. So she tagged uh, James Filan, John Deaton, <laughs> Jeremy Hogan, and many more. Uh, attorney Fred Rispoli did uh, reply. Uh, he said they will likely schedule one, so not to anger the court, but it will go as well as the last two settlement conferences before went. Settlement only happens when both parties finally reach the compromise they can stomach. So doesn't mean anything uh, can happen here. Um, we'll see. Uh, but this is just the next steps, right? XRP has its clarity. Ripple essentially won. Yes, the, the judge said that the institutional sales, which Ripple did, uh, do those count as securities offerings, but it doesn't mean XRP is inherently uh, a, a security. And this is what I've been saying for years. Many of you know, I've said Ripple would have to pay a fine for maybe early sales they did. and But the XRP today and future XRP are not securities. So uh, this is you know the next steps. And remember, Judge Sarah Netburn is the one that said the SEC lacked faithful allegiance to the law. So uh, we'll see what happens and if they do come to any sort of settlement resolution. Now, we got a report here from CNBC. They actually interviewed the chief legal officer at Ripple, Stuart Alarati. And one of the big takeaways, and look at the headline, Ripple says U.S. banks will want to use XRP currency after partial victory in SEC fight. So Stewart got interviewed. He pretty much you know, rehashed a lot of the things he was saying after the victory notice. And I think the important thing here, though, is that XRP has the clarity and it can be used by TradFi institutions. We know Ripple is partnered with a lot of banks, credit card companies, and much more. And a lot of these institutions are going to use XRP via uh, their ODL product. So we have to wait for the details to see how that's executed, given the institutional uh, aspect of the ruling, right? Where institutions, if they're buying XRP directly from Ripple, that could be considered a securities offering because there's a clear contract. However, uh, if the folks, the institutions buy XRP in the open market, um, you know that that could be something they can do, or they borrow XRP from Ripple to do certain transactions. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Um, but bullish statements here: XRP to be used by U.S. banks. Um, this is what we've been talking about for years and watching closely. Now. Speaking of the SEC, of uh, Valkyrie Funds is now the final member in this wave to reach the starting line. The SEC has noticed slash acknowledged their application as of today. All eight filings are now on the SEC's website. So when you file for a Bitcoin spot ETF, the SEC has to accept that application and say, okay, your application looks good. Give us time to review if we're going to approve it, right? So this includes uh, BlackRock, Vanek, Invesco, Fidelity, Wisdom Tree, and so forth. All the big names are here, folks. Everybody's trying to get this Bitcoin ETF. And of course, Grayscale is suing the SEC for not approving its Bitcoin spot ETF. So we shall see. Uh, there's no guarantee that a Bitcoin spot ETF gets approved this year. It could happen till next year. It could happen two years from now. It's hard to tell. But I think the pressure that is mounting on Gary Genser with all these cases and so forth, 
uh, you, you know, I think there's going to be pressure, especially because BlackRock is here, right? BlackRock pretty much runs the world uh, and they have a, what, 570 to one record as far as ETF approvals. Uh, you know, they donate to a lot of politicians and so forth. So uh, we could see, you know, something approved this year. It will be awesome if it's approved, uh, you know, maybe into or as Bitcoin is building momentum into the macro bull market or bull run, you know, with the Bitcoin having next year, we'll see. Uh, but I'm prepared. I'm buying the dips. I'm dollar cost averaging, not financial advice. Of course, do your own research. And uh, there's a lot of capital that's going to come into this market as a result of these spot ETFs. Now, we got news here from Bloomberg that Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong is set to meet with House Democrats in a closed-door session will, which will focus on digital asset legislation. Armstrong is seeking clear rules for crypto from Washington. This is great. We got to go in on the offensive. We got to win these Democrats because remember, Gary Gensler is a Democrat. He's Democrat appointed right by the Biden administration, and there are a good amount of Democrats and and some of the louder voices like Brad Sherman and Elizabeth Warren, who really their voices, uh, you know, they they it drowned out the voices of the Democrats who support crypto, like Kristen Gillibrand, like uh, Darren Soto, and so forth. So we need to get more of them on board. So I like that Brian is doing this, and we need you look uh, bipartisan support to get a bill through. So uh, this is good news, and shout out and kudos to Brian for doing this. Uh, because the industry needs it, folks. Now, we continue to see Bitcoin miners are expanding, doubling down, going public. And it makes sense because the halving is coming up next year. They, you know, they're, pu- they're pretty much turning up the the amount of mining to the max, uh, trying to get as much Bitcoin before the hash rate, before the halving happens where the rewards are cut in half, right? So here we got news that BitDeer um, is doing well. Its company stock price is up. And here's the headline. As SPAC IPOs have grown scarce, BitDeer's success bucks a trend. The company's stock price is up 30% in the last month as its mining data center in Bhutan gets set to begin operating. So mining is happening around the globe, folks. Um, You know, there are some people who hate Bitcoin. They don't see Bitcoin's use case. But I see it as a a store of value, as hard money in a world of inflation. uh, That's a big big uh, use case similar to gold, right? You don't go around buying stuff with gold. (laughs) It's not that type of asset. And that's similar to Bitcoin, right? Uh, Bitcoin is not great for daily transactions. It's slow. Um, But one could argue that's a feature, not a bug. Um, But look, it's it's not great for day-to-day usage. But as a store of value, as digital gold, it's pretty good. And it is the best performing asset over the past 10 years. So you can't argue with those facts. So uh, the company's stock began trading on NASDAQ uh, on April 14th via a special purpose acquisition company, a SPAC merger with Blue Safari Group Acquisition Corp. BitDeer CEO Matt Lingu Kong told BlockWorks in an email that the company's listing provides it with increased visibility and credibility. Here's a quote. We strategically deployed five mining data centers, including two mining data centers in Norway and three more in the U.S., with expansion plans to create local, more local jobs and build up more key positions in the company based in the U.S., he added. Becoming a public company will enable us to reach these twin goals. So we're seeing a lot of Bitcoin miners going public and expanding. I interviewed the CEO of CleanSpark, which is also a publicly traded Bitcoin mining company. Uh, if you guys haven't seen that interview, be sure to check it out. So uh, this is a good sign, right? The, the market is turning bullish, companies going public, mergers, acquisitions, a lot of expansion and investments. Now, we got some news here around Chainlink. Many of you know, uh, I am very bullish on Chainlink. I think the tech they have, their oracles uh, are going to be key in a lot of the other blockchains out there to be successful. And there are a lot of blockchains that are tapping Chainlink's uh, services. So Chainlink founder says CCIP opens DeFi for business. Chainlink's cross-chain interoperability protocol to launch Monday looks to build better bridges. Chainlink is switching on its uh, cross-chain interoperability protocol Monday with Synthetics getting early access to its mainnet. A testnet will open up to all developers on Thursday, July 20th. The protocol builds upon Chainlink's extensive Oracle network to differentiate it 
from competitors while it looks to capitalize on connections forged along traditional financial rails. As blockchains scale, whether layer two networks, side chains, or app specific chains, these networks will need to communicate with each other. Existing cross-chain solutions, such as bridges, for example, have, have attempted to tackle the problem of moving data and assets safely with mixed results. Other interoperability solutions, such as light clients, such as IBC, general message passing with Axelar and other hybrid schemes have tried to fill the gaps, and now Chainlink is joining in the effort. CCIP will be available on Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, and Avalanche. Folks, uh, not financial advice. I am bullish on Link. I've been uh, accumulating Link for a while. Those of you who are channel members have access to my portfolio. That you, you are able to see the Google Doc. So if you want to support the channel, you can certainly do that. Um, but big news, my friends. And uh, I am happy to see Gary Genser looking defeated, timid, docile. He doesn't have that same aggression. He's taking L's from every direction. And I can't wait for Coinbase and Grayscale to mop the floor with him. Uh, it's going to be a beautiful thing. Finally, guys, if you want to support the podcast, please check out the merchandise store where you can buy official podcast branded gear, as well as fire Gary Genser t-shirts and hats and more. So uh, thank you for your support. And I'll talk to you all later. Mm -hmm.